Okay, so the next session is a new chapter in uh, fintech lending, and uh, this uh, it is the uh, old gang here, a uh, <laughs> big a big team, and uh, so uh, Todd is going to moderate the session. Thanks a lot. Uh, and the QR code outside has all the bios of everyone. Right. So uh, from left to right, Jonah Crane from Claros Group, uh, Nat Hoops from Upstart, uh, myself, Kevin Moss from. Uh, hit, uh, uh, Kevin Moss Consulting and Oliver Wyman, Armin Meyer from Lending Club, and Emre Sanger from Vantage Score. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by giving a little uh, introductory uh, thought about the topic of uh, that we're going to talk about today. So uh, I think essentially uh, what's happening in the current environment in fintech is that a great winnowing has begun and we're going to see uh, what business models survive in an environment that's less benign than the environment that we've been uh, living in for the last few years and which really uh, is the only environment that modern fintech has ever known. Uh, big question, you know, has business to consumer fintech uh, really delivered on a promise of uh, significantly greater financial inclusion, lower cost. Uh, I think it's the jury's out. There have been some great um, things happening on the margins that are helpful. But overall, you know, they promised us jetpacks and we, we're not flying yet. Uh, and uh, with respect to fintech lenders, which is our topic today, most of them have essentially reproduced the relatively fragile wholesale funded finance company model. And that um, reality is coming uh, to the fore right now. Um, the neobanks uh, are rebundling uh, something that looks like the bank product set, uh, including lending, but with all of its historical problems and significantly worse economics because of a very limited uh, group of revenue sources. And I think we're going to see some pressure on that uh, coming pretty soon. Um, the crypto consumer project, which promised all those great things of democratization and decentralization, you know, may have run its course, at least for now. We'll see what the next uh, generation brings us. Um, and we're really at a, an inflection point uh, in, in the post-great financial crisis crop of, of fintechs. And we're going to find out soon which fintech business models are resilient enough to handle a more challenging environment and build a, a long-term sustainable value. Uh, and you got to keep in mind that this fintech thing happened over a very short time period. This is SoFi, and you can look at SoFi uh, over the years that it grew from a very tiny enterprise to a very large one. Um, but during that time, interest rates were uh, unusually and unbelievably low and steady. Equity markets were booming like never before. Uh, there was enormous credit growth in that environment and very, very, very low losses. And all of that is, you know, turning around as we speak. Obviously, interest rates up, equity markets down, and a, an open question, which we'll be talking about soon, about what's really going on with the credit market. Um, of course, macro changes like that affect fintechs in different ways. Lenders uh, have to deal with funding challenges, credit challenges, and uh, a lack of private capital to support uh, growth without profitability. All those are implications we'll be talking about in a second. And the market consequences uh, are a big focus on profitability, um, hype being discounted, uh, and uh, a number of fintechs we'll find in the lending space and elsewhere are going to get stranded. They're orphaned, can't raise new capital, um, have great businesses or, or great products, but are really challenged. And uh, winners and losers will become evident, and I think we're going to see a great deal of consolidation in the industry. Um, with uh, M&A, um, fewer IPOs, more M&A, uh, and perhaps some of these companies being uh, uh, brought into the more traditional financial system. And from a regulatory standpoint, from all the people you've been talking to over the last two days, regulatory catch-up is happening. Uh, the regulators are always a little behind, uh, notwithstanding what Adrian just said. Uh, I think New York is really actually very much uh, in advance of uh, thinking on a lot of things. But most regulators are now just catching up with what's been going on in fintech. And uh, we're going to see uh, significant changes in oversight um, as evidenced by the kind of comments that uh, Rory Chopra made earlier. OK, that's it. Um, now let's start out by uh, asking Jonah the first question, which is about um, what's really going on in the funding markets for fintech lenders. We've got 
uh, people from a couple of fintech lenders here, which we're going to ask the same question in a minute. But what's going on in the environment, and what do you, what do you see out there? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you sort of teed it up in your intro slides when you referred to fragile, uh, you know, some fragile funding structures. And back in 2016, when I was at the Treasury Department, we put together uh, a white paper on marketplace lending, and it was called something, you know, very dull, like all these government reports. It was like marketplace lending opportunities and risks, or something like that. And Two of the risks that we highlighted um, in, in the report, of course, were one, a lot of the new fintech lenders had not been through a credit cycle. Well, guess what? It's you know six years later and they still haven't been through a real credit cycle. Pandemic notwithstanding, I think all the government support uh, clearly prevented something like a real credit cycle. We'll see if we're entering one now. So one of the things that was going on in, in May when some of the challenges in the lending space started to arise was uh, you know the beginnings of questions around are we, are we in a recession, are we going into a recession, and what's going to happen to the to the credit picture in particular as the stimulus rolls off, and I think some other panelists are going to address those uh, uh, later. One of the other risks we talked about in the white paper was you know, the risks of a funding model that was basically subject to the whims of the capital markets, and we know what happens in the capital markets when things become uncertain. They pull back, and I think we had you know, really pretty extreme uncertainty in May around things like the interest rate outlook, right? How fast and how high was the Fed going to raise interest rates? Um, you know, what was the inflation outlook? Combine that with the recession picture I just, uh, I just mentioned. And I think you had extreme uh, caution on the part of capital markets. And so I think for at least a period, the capital markets said, okay, enough, pause, let's hold on now. And, you know, I think lenders who uh, are able to make loans and take loans on their balance sheet and fund those with deposits were able to, are able to survive periods like that more easily than, uh, than, than lenders who are relying on the capital markets. And, you know, it's easy to pick on Matt and my friends at Upstart here because they're a public company um, and so it's more visible for them. But obviously there's a huge, uh, a huge array and a huge sort of, you know, fintech lending sector that is dependent on some combination of the capital markets and uh, sort of a, a group of banks to buy their loans. And I think they all ran into trouble in, uh, in the May time period. And so it's really that combination of sort of macro events um, bumping up against uh, uh, sort of tricky business models. And my final point, Todd, was just to point out that you know, I was reading a research report yesterday about SoFi, similar model, uh, you know, going back five years, six years ago when we wrote that report, SoFi was one of the companies we highlighted. And like Lending Club, they now have a bank and can balance sheet their own loans. And um, uh, SoFi is, is quickly transitioning away from reliance on uh, warehouse facilities and funding themselves with deposits. They raised a billion and a half dollars in deposits in the last quarter. It cost them 1.8% to raise those deposits, so they're paying up for them. They're still saving 100 basis points relative to their warehouse lines. So pretty compelling economics. Okay, Nat. Well, um, your CEO, Dave Girard, has been very clear that he, he likes the marketplace model. Um, there was a, a bump in the road just recently. What, what's the long-term thinking about the strength and viability of, the, of relying on capital markets and bank partners for, for funding? Sure. I think, uh, sure. I think that you can really separate our business between um, lenders that actually, they're not just buying loans, they're actually making loans with our technology. And so that's a significant portion of, of what we do. And then the more traditional uh, lenders in the marketplace model who are banks that then originate and distribute uh, into the capital markets. And so the funding environment has led to certainly volatility in our, in our results. We had, uh, you know, five consecutive fantastic quarters and then, you know, high growth, high profitability. And then a, you know, a really challenged quarter around some pretty unique circumstances. I don't think a lot of people in this room saw, you know, 9% inflation uh, coming or else I think we would have bought different financial instruments. Um, so there's been a, a significant change. And so I think when I think about our model, um, you know, ultimately credit performance is key. Um, there's going to be a flight to quality. So if you can deliver um, the capital markets a solid risk adjusted return um, over time uh, you will continue to have funding there can be periods of dislocation of course but i think that we have been pretty clear that we like the ability to be uh, a high growth um, and profitable platform and so um, that's where we uh, continue to be um, so let me turn it over to armin and say you know well obviously lending club has taken a different path and interestingly Again, no, nothing um, comparative here, but at one point, um, this company was worth eight times what your company is, and now it's worth close to the same. So what, what's going on at the Lending Club, and how do you think of that same question? Well, thank you for pointing that out, Todd. We really appreciate it. <laughs> I'm sure that Nat, Nat appreciates it Particularly painful. For <laughs> we went through that pain some years ago, Nat, so welcome. 
Um, you know, so I think Adrian Harris just mentioned about history repeats itself, and I'm feeling deja vu right now, as Jonah touched on the, the, the last kind of crisis two years ago. I think, Dan, I see you on screen. Jonah, I see you here. Uh, Jalop invited a few, of us, a few of us to speak about what would happen in this new COVID world. Would funding dry up? Would our businesses go under because of dried up funding? And I think our message at the time was, to your point, Todd, there will be winners and losers. Not everyone has a robust marketplace to support all the loans they're making. Um, and those that did not have robust marketplaces um, are no longer with us, some of them. There are names that were not, are not here today. And so to Todd's point, we're going to see the same thing happen again here. But I believe there has been a test. Yes, there was government funding. Um, but we did see the investor market completely dry up. We did not see government support in that market for quite some time. And there are survivors, and I, I would commend Nat's marketplace, I would commend Lending Club's marketplace for getting through that, but there will be winners and losers again. Now, we have acquired a bank since then. That is a huge boon, let's, let's be honest. The massive tool in our toolkit to get through this one would have been nice to have it last time, but how are we gonna use that? A bank doesn't just fill the gap where investors retreat. It doesn't just provide low-cost funds to fill that gap. Um, it also signals to your investors and to your broad marketplace hey, we're eating our own cooking. We're gonna put, we're gonna use our cheap deposits. We're gonna take our loans. We have so much confidence in our underwriting. We're gonna put it on our balance sheet. So it's a signal to the market that we believe and you should believe too. It's also helpful to the market to keep prices down um, uh, and funding costs to our, our non-deposit uh, funding sources because it's less regulatory risk. There's this whole debate about is a non-bank partner with a bank the same as a bank loan? We used to be a non-bank partner bank. We are now a fintech bank, and we can now obviate that debate, and we think that'll make our funding market even stronger to get through this crisis. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, coming through this conversation from Jonah through the two of you is this question of credit, right? Because one of the great uncertainties now is what's really going on in the credit market, and that affects funding availability, obviously. And there's a great deal of uncertainty. So we have a couple of real experts here we're going to give uh, some nuanced views of what's really going on. So first, I'll start with um, Emery. And uh, the first question is pretty basic. What's going on? <laughs> what do you think is happening right now? Well, what's, uh, what's going on has been actually so far pretty good news. Um, just rewinding back to the beginning of the pandemic, there were lots of questions about what will happen with the consumer credit. Are we really at that at the end of that long-term uh, sort of benign environment from a, from a risk perspective. Um, what seems to be have happened so far is that all of the things we talked about with respect to stimulus, the government intervention, the unemployment, all of the accommodation programs uh, have helped consumers. So far, what we have seen is that through the course of the pandemic, consumer credits uh, remain strong, and so far it remains strong. When we look at some of our metrics, and we've been monitoring these data points very, very regularly. Uh, right now, if you look at average credit scores, for example, a, a sort of a basic measure of the overall health of the consumer credit, uh, credit scores have actually increased about 13, 14 points compared to the beginning of 2020. And the reason for that is that credit scores are summary metrics. They look at a few things. How are consumers doing in terms of keeping up with their payments, their balances, their utilization, are they seeking new credit? When we look at the more recent history, we are seeing that in all of those uh, measures, uh, the, the, the performance of the consumers have been actually quite, quite good. Um, delinquencies still remain pre-pandemic levels. Yes, we are seeing an increase, uh, but we are still below pre-pandemic levels in terms of delinquency rates, so there's really from our perspective at a, at a broader level, that doesn't really con create a concern. When we look at balances, uh, balances basically started to grow back beginning in sort of spring of 2021, and since then they have been monotonically increasing. When we look at average card balances that consumers have as a, as a basic measure, but still we are below pre-pandemic levels. Utilization, is below pre-pandemic levels. Um, they're all trending up. We see that as a sign of normalization um, rather, than, uh, rather than worsening. Um, when we are looking at things like our consumers seeking actively new credit, 
Um, we are seeing certainly on the unsecured side, there's the, the, the demand is there. Uh, personal loans and, and credit cards have been really um, originating. Uh, not so much, of course, more recently with, with mortgages and, and auto tends to be a little bit more seasonal, but generally nothing out of the ordinary. The only word of caution we have these days is like we're looking at any particular consumer segments, any pockets, which can serve as perhaps leading indicators of risk. Two areas, for example, got our attention in the last several months now is what's happening with younger consumers and what's happening with lower income consumers. Now, these segments are important because they tend to have less capacity, less resiliency to deal with you know, things getting worse. Uh, Gen Zs, for example, we are seeing that their use of credit has grown significantly more than other, uh, other age groups. Their credit card balances, their personal loan balances have really shown pretty significant levels of growth. And when we look at their delinquency levels, they are the only first, only age group that now have delinquency levels that are exceeding pre-pandemic levels. So something for us to, to think about. Similar story on the lower income consumers uh, in terms of usage of credits and some signs of delinquency is picking up, but um, I would say just putting everything together. Uh, so far, the consumers have really, uh, really held up well. The, the question, of course, is what happens in the current environment with the inflation, with the continuing rising interest rates, um, and there's there's a lot of uncertainty. But as we stand, uh, we are we are you know generally uh, optimistic. Yeah, and I only want to just echo when you hear the word deteriorating credit performance, you have to remember that losses were suppressed dramatically by all the stimulus. So deteriorating credit performance means we told investors to expect that they were going to, losses were going to be here. Their losses were way below that, and now they're returning towards, towards normalization. And so I think that there's a lot of fact and fiction and, and fear out there in the market because of some of the things Jonah mentioned. What's the Fed going to do? What's the risk premium I need to demand in unsecured credit right now? But it is not a failed credit performance story from any of the reputable platforms that are out I there. Think, I think that's absolutely right. And the, you know, the question that everybody is trying to struggle with, and there's really very little to tell you what the answer is, is the most likely scenario, at least unless we get into a severe recession, is that credit performance will go back to some sort of long-term trend. Um, and then the downside scenario is obviously something worse, but there's no indication now where that's going. Um, one of the things that Matt's, uh, um, sorry, um, that um, uh, the uh, Nats company uh, has done has really looked at different um, indicators for credit performance and is using AI and other things. And the same thing happens at Lending Club. You at Vanascore, uh, how are you thinking about new ways of assessing uh, credit, new inputs? What's going on in terms of the credit world? There's a lot of criticism about you know traditional credit scores for being backward looking and and uh, non inclusive. What what are you what's cooking at uh, your shop? Yeah, so um, for the most part, when you look at consumer credit data as it's represented in the in the in the credit re credit uh, bureaus. That data works. Uh, it's 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 uh, it it has demonstrated over the years that it, it's it's effective in in predicting risk. The problem is uh, there is large percentages of consumers where they have very limited information in their credit files, and in some cases they don't have any credit file information. One of our core mission objectives is to to really um, support in inclusion. Uh, Vantage score actually, in our existing models, we can score about 37 million more consumers compared to some of the other conventional credit scoring models. And the reason for that is that we are able to look at different data points and we are using some of the better methodologies from a modeling perspective in, in that assessment. So my, my perspective as a data scientist is that I think we are, we are reaching the asymptotes in terms of the, the, the information, the credit files, and to really support inclusion and access to credit, we need to look at augmenting this information with additional sources. For example, uh, rent and utility is a big piece. Uh, we know that rent and utility data can be made available as part of the credit records of these consumers. There are some efforts around increasing that reporting and we're fully supportive of that. But beyond the credit reports, there are other structured and unstructured data sources 
that has demonstrated value. One thing that, for example, we're very much focused on right now is um, looking at bank bank information. So 96% of consumers have a bank account. Um, when you look at their credit bureau record, you can only see one side of the story, which is how they have been doing with their obligations. But there is another piece, which is uh, looking at their incomes, looking at their cash flows, what's coming in, what's coming out, how they're managing those balances. And for a lot of consumers who lack that credit experience, sometimes because of historically systemic issues and access to credit, in some cases by choice, some consumers, some cultures, they may not want to interact with credit as much as, 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 as you want as a data person to, to, to see. Uh, so what we are finding is that there's tremendous value there's tremendous incremental value in those type of alternative data sources. Uh, we are working on those. I know others are working on those. I, I suspect we are going to see those type of elements being brought in and become more of the mainstream credit scoring processes. I know many of the lenders, some uh, in this platform, are already using those type of data elements. There are some challenges with respect to establishing standards, establishing compliance requirements, making sure that the data is well governed, that can be displayed, that can be disputed, that can be corrected, etc. So those pieces are being worked on. But as I see it, the direction is definitely towards that. Good. Uh, so um, I'm going to ask Kevin, who uh, you know has guided many of the leading fintechs in their uh, credit development, what he's seeing out there in the fintech world specifically, you know, in, in light of uh, the kind of things that Emery has said about the overall situation and what's going on in, in new methods of looking at uh, credit performance. Yeah, first, thanks, thanks for having me here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little less optimistic. Uh, maybe it's because I was a CRO for as long as I have than others are. I mean, we are seeing deterioration in credit or normalization, I think is a good word. It's definitely in younger, non-prime vintages. Uh, but, you know, 2021 vintages and personal loans overall are the worst they've been in the last few years. Um, I think we're, we've come to an end somewhat, although bank account balances may still be reasonably healthy. The stimulus and forbearance and deferments are coming to an end. We still have student loan payments to start to resume for 40 million people or so. So, and then we have a slowing economy, whether you believe it's a recession or not, uh, we have a slowing economy. We have higher rates, we have high inflation. Um, so I think there's a lot of things to watch out for. I think in 2021, some risk people that I, that I've talked to got a lot of pressure uh, after delinquency and losses were so low, may have loosened a little bit uh, in some places that now they're tightening back up home. Um, so I think FinTech certainly doesn't have the history that banking does in working through these types of issues. Um, but, but overall, uh, I think we're going to see somewhat of an orderly normalization. Um, I, uh, to build a little bit on what was discussed here in terms of using bank data, I've been using it for 20 years. I'm an advisor to one of the platforms that's been using it for five, six years now. Uh, it's very powerful. Um, and, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about today was, you know, like, in talking last night with some of the attendees uh, and thinking about some of the things uh, I was preparing for this discussion, it got me thinking about, like, one of the things that is driving, I think, a little bit higher uh, delinquency, particularly on the thinner, less established customer, are, are uh, some of the credit builder trades. Like, for, certainly agree that, um, rent, utilities, those are some of the good ones. There's been some innovation in this space where some of the product structures aren't necessarily uh, being treated as trade lines should be uh, that are causing some challenge in credit, credit scores. And then I think when we have buy now, tr 
trade, buy now, pay later trades on the horizon to be added in some form to the credit file. When you looked at the analysis that was done by some of the scoring vendors, you know, t whether you treat it as revolving or installment had a big impact on whether scores went up or down. And so, so what, as I started to think about this, uh, and I also work with uh, like uh, income share ag agreement organizations, like there's so much financial innovation going on. I think that the credit bureaus need to be innovating the reporting structures at the same time. And what we've been trying to do is, is force new financial products into older uh, product structures that don't really work. And so in the long run, I think one big opportunity for financial inclusion, in my view, is to innovate the reporting structures so we have new trade lines. Buy now, pay later is a new trade line type. Vantage score should be able to treat that as a separate trade line, and how does it really contribute to the risk of, a, of an applicant? Uh, income share agreements should be uh, enabled to be reported, uh, and be, but sometimes they don't have payments if people's income is below a certain amount. Or we don't really have a dollar amount because people agree for a term how long someone is going to pay a percentage of their income. You know, if you think about payday lending, if you think about buy now, pay here, uh, auto uh, outlets, or rent to own, all of these are non-traditional 30-day type structures that in the long run, if we had one place to go for all of those, our models would be better, and I think inclusion would be better. So just to clarify, um, one of the comments you made, because I think the audience may not uh, understand what you meant by the credit builder trades. There's a, a lot of fintech activity really based around inclusion, trying to um, structure products that will help you improve your credit score so that you ultimately will end up with a uh, cheaper loan. And, you know, a classic one is using a credit card, uh, but structuring it in a way that there's not actually a, uh, an advance of credit. It's automatically paid uh, uh, a monthly or, or bi-monthly or even weekly um, out of your uh, checking account so you never actually go into debt. And is that the kind of thing you're talking about in terms yeah, of, yeah? It is. And, and, and look, it, you know, it helps people. Uh, it also, a risk of this is it enables synthetic frauds potentially to, to better legitimize their credit file. So I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity for the regulatory community, for the credit bureaus, for all of the subscribers and participants to work together on this. And I think financial innovation gets out a little bit in front, I think, as you referred to, Todd. But I think this is really one of the big opportunities for us. Like, the, all this technology has given us the chance to advance the way data is captured. And, and I think more of that data, whether it be deposit aggregation or new trade lines that, that don't exist today is going to help us do a better job. Okay. Let me, let me ask, uh, you know, there's been a lot of conversation over the last couple of days about the increase in fraud in the payment space. Is the same thing happening, um, you know, Nat and Armin and uh, the two credit guys here in, in, the pay, in the lending space? Has it been a significant change due to the um, COVID and everybody being online? I mean, this is an area I, I have a lot. I'm an advisor to a bunch of fraud platforms as well. Um, you know, with PPP loans, with stimulus fraud, a lot of uh, checking accounts got opened uh, to receive those funds. And some of those identities over time with their emails and phone numbers have been legitimized. And so there's no question that there's more digital fraud going on now. I think all the platforms are seeing it. Um, those who have really good defenses against it uh, probably are okay, but fraud will move to the weakest link. So it's moving, it typically moves to new market participants or people who have weaker protections. Okay. So we've talked about um, the challenges from, uh, for funding. We've talked about credit and it's, it's pretty clear that it's less good than it's been, but we don't really know where it's going. 
we do know that the equity market is is down substantially, and that's having a, a an effect on what venture capitalists are doing. And we do have a venture capitalist with us, Dan, behind me. And uh, so, um, you know, <clears throat> there's been a long period where um, funding, uh, equity funding, was available to startups to build businesses. Um, without those businesses necessarily showing a clear path to profitability, right? And um, the current uh, scenario is a little bit different. So I'll ask Dan, you know, given that the valuations are way down, you as a fintech VC, you know, what are you thinking about when you think about opportunities uh, in fintech lending uh, or adjacent fields? What's, what's really happened as a result of the uh, big equity declines in the last six months? Question. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, uh, Philip Fett, for inviting me here. I wish I could be on the stage with you guys. So uh, we have talked about uh, what's happening in, uh, in the public markets. The valuations are down for for pretty much uh, everyone across the board, especially for, for uh, technology firms. Um, and uh, beginning of the year, when we saw the uh, the sell off in the public markets, we only initially, as some of the reports we have been reading, we thought the impact was will be mostly on the uh, growth stage, late stage, pre IPO firms. But quickly, the, 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 the contagion spread to the early stage uh, space, which is where our fund uh, primarily focuses on. So this is not just about lending versus non-lending. It's across the board. And it, this is not really about small haircut. It's actually, we're talking about big shave. Um, so VCs are obviously more uh, you know, cautious these days. I think uh, even six or eight months ago, you know, a company can came to you with 15-page slide deck and ask for, you know, a you know two million dollar uh, equity raise at a uh, 15, 15 million dollar pre money, and uh, if you say hey let me take a look and then I'll think about it. Guess what? The next day you call back, the deal's gone. It's oversubscribed. So so every VC back in the day was competing to get in, to get a, to get a seat at the cap table, but those days are long gone. Some of the uh, founders probably haven't really woken up to the new reality yet. But now VCs for the first time you know in the I guess, you know, since the last five years, we have now have the real opportunity to negotiate uh, for uh, more realistic and more favorable terms uh, from the investors' uh, vantage point. Uh, and also, investors are more metric driven. So um, if you look at the, the deals being done in the last couple of years, you see companies getting, you know, 20x, 30x, 40x, even 100x multiples on their valuations. What I mean is, let's say, if you have a Annual revenue of $100 million, a 10x multiple will be, you'll be valued at a billion dollars. A 100 million, a 100x multiple, that means you'll be valued at $10 billion. Now the multiple has come down to between five and 10. Sometimes, you know, most of the deals we're seeing, are, we're seeing today are actually hovering around the lower end of the range. Now, specifically getting to the uh, fintech lending, I think if you, are, if you want to start a lending business, I think your challenge is probably greater than the, the rest of the cohort. Uh, for, for most of the reasons that this panel has has been talked about in the in the in the last couple of you know 10 20 minutes so the the high inflation rate the the uh, uh the upcoming um, recession and this is really chicken and egg thing right so lending is a capital intensive business you need to you need to have capital in order for you to lend and uh, many times the the amount of equity you can raise is hinged upon how much capital you can line up you know to to finance your, your lending business. And as a startup, you know, especially an early stage startup, you only have a great idea. You probably have a great business plan, but you have no metrics to show. And I think that's really causing some of the uh, early stage uh, funders to, uh, to, uh, to raise uh, uh, capital from the, uh, from the investors. And, uh, but I think down the road, in the next eight to 12 months, the lenders in the space, I think, now we'll have most of the challenges are going to be subprime lenders or lenders that are focusing on lower income consumers. And the headwind is not just only coming from, you know, the recession or the, or the, or the capital market, but also from the regulatory agencies. I think there will be much more regulatory scrutiny around these lending businesses. But that doesn't mean lending is dead. So uh, our fund, for, for example, we are, we are still looking at two, I think, quite distinctive opportunities. Well, first and foremost, we, 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 we bet on great founders. So that's the first criteria you have to, you have to uh, meet. The secondly, we look at the group, good ideas. So the two areas we're looking at, one is really we're looking at uh, the underserved market. So, I mean, this, is, this may sound like a cliche, but we, uh, we let a uh, uh, seed investment in a company called Funded. They are really focusing on 
uh, providing capital to women-owned small businesses. If we think a gender gap is still pretty big in a workplace, believe it or not, in, when it comes to um, you know, uh, funding for uh, women-owned small businesses, the gap is much, much bigger. And the second area we're looking at is not really about lending, but actually companies, they're in the SaaS business, they are really providing better technologies to, to, to enhance lending. So one of the things, and Todd, you and, the, you and the Kevin, you guys know uh, from your affiliation with, with, uh, with Nika, is fair play. We, uh, so what they do is they really try to make uh, lending more equitable and help lenders comply with you know, fair lending. But I think the, 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 service is, the scope of the service is much broader. It's not just about fair lending. It's also about fair marketing, fair account opening, and the fair insurance. So I think there's going to be lots of interesting applications for the services that they can provide. The second area is really about you know, um, helping lenders to save money, right? So if you think, of, think about what's happening in the mortgage uh, industry in the last uh, six to eight months, they are probably you know, bleeding the most compared to other lenders, lots of layoffs. And, uh, and this is something that the mortgage industry hasn't seen for, for 10 years almost since the last uh, uh, recession. But we're looking at a company called Arley Technology. What they do is they actually provide a, uh, a technology solutions to really replace lending officers. So you pay a salary of one lending officer that can replace you know, hundreds of lending officers that you have, to, you have to hire when the business is booming. And when a business is coming down, you, know, you don't have to really... Um, you know, uh, fire, uh, lay off that many people, but with one solution that can really be much, much more uh, efficient for you to run the business. And this is also a good opportunity. It's, if you're a mortgage lender, you know, uh, in the last 10 years, when the interest rates were so low, uh, it, anybody can, can make money because customer, customer just flock to you to, to get a, their loans refiled to get a new, uh, new house, new, new mortgage. Now it's really time to really think about your tax stack and then re rebuild it. Okay, so there, you know, there has been a lot of effort. Uh, uh, you see companies that are, are providing um, software and um, operational structures, and some even using um, uh, the blockchain. So Figure, uh, which was started by the uh, gentleman who also started SoFi, is trying to create a, a separate method for um, uh, uh, originating and selling and tracking uh, mortgages. Um, the challenges that a lot of these companies are going to have is, uh, uh, is as things get complicated in, in the mortgage space or in, in other lending spaces is um, they're trying to create a separate method for doing something that or uh, where an existing method already exi uh, exists. And so for big financials and Wall Street, it's a little difficult to have, be running two different systems for, for one product. I think that's a challenge for the industry. What do you think, guys think about... Um, Small business economy. Any, any difference between that and and what we've been talking about in consumer? I can take that. I yeah. think the small business space is a little bit harder than the consumer space, in my opinion. Um, and a major reason for that is because consumers can make more informed choices about the credit they're taking than small businesses can. So I have a hard time reading the results there because a lot of times small businesses are taking loans at much higher rates than they anticipated. And when I was chief of staff at the banking department, uh, coming out, the New York banking department, now called DFS, coming out of that crisis back in the Great Recession, we saw small businesses desperate for credit um, taking loans out. They didn't realize how much they were ending up paying for those loans. And so today I worry we're going to see that again. We might reach the wrong conclusion about bad underwriting across the board, when really, I think, to Commissioner Tropper's point today, if there was more transparency, we could have created a more competitive market if small business lenders were out there producing transparent um, prices and terms like we see for consumers so we can better assess the small business market and how small business lenders are doing. Yeah, and there's been some movement in that area right now. Yeah, I mean, we, there's the, the Small Business Borrow Bill of Rights, which, which Armin's firm helped, helped fund and found, um, has really made some headway in a few states. Um, you know, the, the thing that I'm seeing in the policy context, in addition to that effort to bring transparency to the small business market, is really CRA reform. So all of us, I think, are trying to harness um, fintech for the purpose of inclusion, right? I mean, that is a core goal, is to find credit or products that are useful to people who have previously been overlooked. And when, when you look at traditional credit scoring, four-fifths of black borrowers have credit scores under 700. Okay, millions of them have never defaulted on a loan. Okay, this is not because of defaults, this is because of the way the traditional credit scoring is done. 
And so there's nothing wrong with a credit score, but there is something wrong in our view with the way credit scores are often used to just lop off a significant portion of your applicant pool and deny them even an opportunity to apply for credit. So when we talk about why does Upstart use alternative data, why are we partnering with community development financial institutions and minority depository institutions? Why are we doing that? Because ultimately, we don't want to be just another solution of, you know, here's another loan for somebody who doesn't need a loan, or here's another loan for somebody who's got 50 offers in their in their in their mailbox, right? You're we trying want, to you're trying to find the prime that's hidden in subprime. Right? Find the hit, find the hidden prime, provide them with a fair prime offer of credit for people who previously would have been overlooked, treated as subprime, and that is a you know when 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 Director Chopra and 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 uh, Acting Comptroller Sue say, what is the purpose of the innovation? That to us is a very high-minded purpose to say all of these people who would have been denied from even being part of the applicant pool. And I, I hear the ads when I'm when I'm in Washington D.C. You hear the ads. If you have over a 700 credit score, you can get approved in 10 minutes. You just told four fifths of black borrowers not to apply. Okay, so to us, that's that's a practice that again, especially in a product in personal loans, unsecured personal loans, where you have, you know, a $1,500 minimum product, a $2,000 minimum size product. You know, that's a product that in theory, a prime loan could benefit everyone. It shouldn't be directed just at the super prime and super prime consumers in order for you to then say, well, I have a very, very low, low loss rate and my APRs are very low and my differentials between minority and, and white borrowers are not that different. Well, that's only because you cut the, the vast majority out of your applicant pool. And so we believe that alternative data, AI, has helped build more accurate models. And if you combine that with CRA reform, where now all of a sudden, you know, financial institutions are gonna be nudged towards building more inclusive products, you're gonna actually start to get somewhere with, with financial institutions saying, well, wait a second, you know, maybe this product that I'm offering, I should look at some of this alternative data, I should look at some of these AI tools in order to, to build a more inclusive final product. Mix. So Jonah, what do you, when you look at the regulatory environment, um, there's been a lot of discussion about AI and you know, the risks of AI. Um, this company has shown some of the benefits of AI um, and uh, you know, the, um, the question of inclusion. What, what do you think um, alternative data and AI, where is that going from a regulatory standpoint? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, it's, it's now a theme that's come up like four times in our conversation just here, so clearly very salient, um, right? And Nat mentioned some stats. Uh, I think a majority of U.S. consumers don't have a prime credit score, so this is a very, you know, very big, uh, very big issue to challenge. I mean, I think there has been good work done over the last several years by policymakers um, in trying to get their arms around cash flow data first and foremost, right? How can you leverage the data that's in your bank account about your income and your expenses? Amra, you mentioned it earlier. And that so far seems like the, it's, it's got the best, the most momentum uh, in terms of policy acceptance in the policy arena. And let me credit the good work that my friend Melissa Koide is doing with FinReg Lab to sort of bring some empirical analysis to bear on that question. Um, and uh, Director Chopra mentioned this morning that they're going to be pushing forward, um, I guess not till next year now, a, a proposed rule around uh, consumer data access, which will, you know, help to facilitate that and I think broaden, uh, broaden usage there. I think um, getting broader acceptance around other forms of, quote, alternative data, uh, even things like rental data, Amre, that you mentioned, um, still seems like, uh, you know, a little bit far afield. And I think one of my great frustrations is to hear, you know, all this consensus around the fact that the status quo seems broken, or at least it doesn't work for 50 percent of us, um, and lots of concerns with respect to, any, you know, new approaches and what kind of risks they might have, um, and not a lot of discussion or at least not a lot of clarity on, you know, what we think a good model will look like, right? And to misquote somebody from a different context who uh, uh, was on TV the other day, this is, this is sort of the way I, I see that the, the policy debates go all the time. They were criticizing a particular fintech, and I won't name them because it doesn't matter who it was. They said, well, I don't know what the right model is, but that's the wrong model. And that's sort of the way I feel about the debates around, you know, th these policy debates around alternative data and the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning um, that I think, you know, we have to make a little bit more progress in trying to figure out what we think the model is that can support inclusion um, and sort of meets regulatory standards. And so far, there's been a lot of no and a lot of concern about the risks and, and not a lot of progress on figuring out what good looks like from that perspective. I mean, I, I talk, if, if I if I may just maybe just follow up on what uh, what Jonah just said about you know sort of the the, the, the definition of alternative data and bank data obviously sometimes is being used 
interchangeably. So I think in some cases, especially when it comes to small business lending, there's no such thing as alternative data because banking data is probably the best with the cash flow data is probably the best indicators that you can have, the best data you can rely on to underwrite, you know, uh, a, 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 a application for credit. If you want to look for FICO score or vendor score, those scores just don't really, really exist. And even if they do, it's really on the personal. It's not really about the business. So I think, I think, I mean, this this debate about alternative alternative data has been going on for for many years, for at least for the last five six years. But I think it's really time for policymakers and regulators to really, you know, think about you know something that we think is alternative uh, is actually no longer alternative. It's a must have. Yeah, I was just going to say I, I'm working as an advisor to on the FinReg Lab project for uh, using machine learning for credit underwriting, and you know I think the big challenge is uh, you know having seen and built some of these models uh, myself and with clients, like in the fintech world, machine learning has been used for quite a few years, and people are comfortable with it, and I believe there is a way to do this. But we got to bring the rest of the community, the stakeholders, along to believe that just because something is a little more complex doesn't necessarily mean that it's creating additional disparate treatment risk. Well, well you know, that's the big, you know. That's the big issue. Right. And then on the use of alternative data, I mean, I'm happy to hear that uh, Vantage is going to help mainstream this. Um, I've been a believer in uh, deposit data for for two decades, and there are, again, uh, people out there who are using this, and I can tell you those models can be as strong, if not stronger, than traditional credit models can be. Oh, that's good. So switching topic slightly, uh, you know, uh, if we've been having this conversation. Oh, sure. So, yeah. Sorry. I think it's important. Um, so three years ago, we were asked to kind of predict where we'd be in five years. Oh, yeah, good. And I was sitting over there um, last time we were all together in person. And one of the questions was, where are we going to be on this whole AI regulation front? Right. And it wasn't just me, but someone else on the panel as well said, look, you don't need to reinvent a whole new regime. There's this thing called fair lending. A part of fair lending is this thing called disparate impact analysis. Dan mentioned all the companies he's looking at that do disparate impact analysis as a reg tech solution. I think you mentioned fair play. There are others out there. Right. And if we embrace this technology, and we really take this impact seriously, we apply it to our AI models, we apply it to our alternative data, and we keep the regime we have, and we make sure the outputs are correct. And I'm glad to say the regulators have been moving that direction. I wish we had more progress, but it's been, I'm optimistic. Well, they're going from this reactive fear thing to getting serious about methods of determining whether you are you know, meeting disparate impact requirements and whatnot, which is good. So um, if we've been having this conversation around that same time, we've been, talk we've been talking a lot about the relationship between banks and fintechs and banks um, originating loans for fintechs is still going on uh, here, uh, not so much at Lending Club since you have a bank charter. Um, but uh, that issue seems to uh, have uh, settled, even though the lawsuits never really got resolved in any meaningful way. The, um, the challenge, though, is now it feels like the regulatory environment, as we heard really all the regulators, federal regulators talk about, focus very much on this new model of partnership and uh, how to regulate uh, and who to regulate uh, when you're dealing with a bank fintech partnership. And bank, you know, the reality of the, of the lending world, at least in, in, uh, in fintech, is, you know, what I call the three C's. You're, fintechs and banks are competing, often over customers. They're collaborating to get things done, um, and they're... Um, uh, co there's compensation running in, sometimes in both directions. So it's a deep, uh, deeply embedded relationship within FinTech. But what do you guys see uh, in terms of this, uh, what appears to be increasing pressure on compliance, risk management, et cetera, in the, in the uh, relationship between banks and FinTechs? I mean, I think that's especially true in the case of crypto and in any cases where there's been a misrepresentation about FDIC insurance, right? These are just hot button you know, pretty clear that the, the guidance of the statements and the regulatory actions that are coming out of the agencies couldn't be clearer. 
Um, I think in lending, it's much more a case where there's a, you know, a, definitely a bias against very high rate partnerships or rent a bank arrangement. And then there's on the flip side, a lot of support for helping community banks, helping mid-sized banks compete in consumer lending via partnerships and marketplace lending where it's below 36% APR. Which most of you guys are doing. Correct. 100% below 36%. Yeah. Founded a trade association together <laughs> where you got to be below that threshold if you have a long term loan to join. Now, that's going to be challenged if, if underlying rates rise because, when you know, the difficulty with usury or flat caps like that is if the, if the treasury rate is at 8%, 36 is going to be right. pretty tight. California, though, has a floating, has an example I of know. a floating rate, which is an interesting, you know. Uh -huh. I mean, Todd, to your point on, oops, sorry, Go ahead, on the regulatory pressure around bank and fintech partnerships, we've Clearly, it's been an uptick. It's been in the news. It's not a secret that, you know, banks who are sort of managing lots of fintech relationships have come under scrutiny from their regulators for their ability to essentially oversee those relationships effectively. And you heard Comptroller Sue's uh, 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 sort of views on that this morning, his concern that the banking stack is becoming fully unbundled and becoming more complex uh, with more layers in it and that, you know, you get pretty far away from the bank by the time you're sort of out at the customer facing end of that stack. And how, how able is the bank to oversee that? At the end of the day, under the current regulatory framework, the bank is ultimately responsible for that, right? And so the question is, how does the bank oversee that? Uh, even though, you know, in, in functional terms, the bank is the service provider to the fintech. In practical, uh, in, in regulatory terms, the, the, the fintech is the service provider to the bank, and the bank is supposed to oversee that. So that's, that's where all the focus has been is, you know, can they effectively oversee these programs? And are they doing so? And there's been a particular focus on consumer compliance in that area. In the lending space, high rate uh, programs are clearly the, the, the focus, but even in the deposit oriented programs, the focus has been more around consumer compliance, you know, marketing materials, are they compliant? Uh, you know, how are you handling customer complaints and making sure that those get processed through and issues get followed up on in the way that they would if this program was all run under the bank's roof? And, that's the perspective that's being taken, but it's taken the regulators a little while to get there and understand these partnerships, but they're definitely focused now. Yeah. And, you know, having been a banker for 31 years and now play in this space for over seven, like one of the big things that isn't talked about is the cultural alignment. Like you in fintechs, you fintech is a fintech because you have fin and tech talent and finding the right balance between, you know, like you'll often find people who run product are from Amazon or Google or Facebook, but then people who are in risk or compliance often come from banks. And so, so it's really important um, when you partner as a banker that you align on the cultural expectations that the two organizations have of each other. Okay, I think that's very true. So let me ask before we uh, switch over to the um, uh, the topic of fintech lending to finish up here, or fi sorry, crypto lending. It, another big development in recent years has really been the growth of, of um, earned wage access and sort of um, salary advance type um, arrangements with a variety of uh, fintechs providing liquidity assistance. You know, it seems to me that it's cor probably correlated with a reduction in payday loan usage in recent years, uh, but it exists in a gray area legal from a legal and regulatory standpoint. Do you see any sense of where that is headed and whether those industries are going to or those uh, companies are going to find uh, a comfortable place in the regulatory environment? Maybe I'll start with Jonah and then ask the two guys. to. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think the regulators have looked at there are a variety of models, first of all, and something like earned wage access. And I think the regulators are, you know, understand that as an accommodation provided through the employer, it may make a lot of sense to help sort of smooth income cycles, right? And in a world where you get paid every two weeks, but, uh, you know, your car breaks down uh, on Monday of the first week, you, you might not have two weeks to wait for that, right? So I think, um, you know, used as a tool to smooth out the income cycle or to match income and expenses, um, uh, it, it I think it's gaining some acceptance, but you know, broader questions around is this is this really a credit product? Uh, masquerading as a non-credit product, et cetera, I think really have to be resolved. And so far, outside of the employer provision context, I think there's a lot more uncertainty. Right. And, and even in that case, we heard um, Rohit's uh, unhappiness with uh, one of the earned wage access providers that was very vocal about its uh, CFPB um, status. So, um, the 
uh, you know, the challenge, they're, they're a pretty good example of uh, something that still exists, which is the square peg and round hole problem in the sense that there's really no place for them in our current regulatory structure. I know California has talked about setting, using the new powers they have to try to establish a regulatory regime for uh, things of this sort. Uh, do we think that that's going to happen and that companies like, say, Dave or Bridget or others will somehow fit into uh, a, a regulatory scheme at the state level? I, I'm personally not optimistic, frankly, on that. Uh, and the reason is because kind of whenever you see a bill move through a state, and, and Dan knows this very well, too, um, at the end of the day, the bill ends up bifurcating the world between what Jonah mentioned, uh, the wage access providers that are going through the employer and those that are not. And I, I just feel like the, the pressure on the folks that are not going through employer, at least for the next few years, is going to be too great to get that kind of special status that you're talking about, Todd. But the folks that do go through the employer, because there is a difference between early wage access, i.e. you already made the money and your employer knows it, and, and, uh, and, and earned, wage, sorry, earned wage access, you already made the money, versus early wage access, you haven't yet, and only your employer really knows that, I think, is the perspective of some legislatures. Okay, that, that, that makes sense. So, um, you know, there is this thing called crypto lending, which we all watched over the last period, and, you know, for um, uh, old folks like ourselves, the concept that somebody was going to offer you 19% for pledging your crypto seemed bizarre. Um, how do you, how do, you as credit people, I'm going to ask Kevin this, how do, you, how, uh, how do you think about crypto lending? Well, obviously some mistakes were made um, as we see what's happened. So Understatement of the year. <laughs> so, so out of this obviously will come some lessons. Um, here's how I sort of think about it. Like crypto is a digital asset. So we've been lending on assets for long, very long time. So what, you know, as I look at it, just as a credit, thinking about credit, like comparable products that I would see would be like margin accounts where at your brokerage, if you were gonna borrow against your assets, you might get 50 cents on the dollar for publicly traded stocks. Crypto's probably more volatile. Um, so I didn't see any product structures that uh, you know, included margining uh, those assets. Then second thing I would say is like another model to think about is if it's a digital asset, like if you lend for your house or for your car, people do a thing called underwriting where they measure your credit, they measure your ability to pay, and they only look at the asset as a secondary source of repayment. So what kind of underwriting? I don't think there was much. And then the last thing I'd say is product structure. Like one thing I learned early on in my first years in lending was always design a product that can be paid back. And so, you know, like, was, is there a draw period? Like if you have a line of credit and then it turns into some kind of repayment structure. So I don't think some of the fundamental uh, rules, if you want to call it that, or, or principles of lending were really followed. And then obviously, you know, you have to have limits on leverage. Behind all this was a hedge fund. Uh, uh, and I also think, you know, at the end of the day, right now we're trying to figure out amongst all the different agencies who should regulate. Um, it sounds like, you know, some of the states are doing a good job. Uh, but capital requirements. So I think the key thing is finding the right combination of all these principles and at the same time not destroying innovation, right? So balancing the need to innovate because digital assets, is it's here, it's the future. But at the same time, you know, what I often do working with fintechs is find that the same mistakes get made over and over again that I've seen in my career. And, uh, and so we just have to see from our experience in other lending products how to design a safe and sound system. Okay, so uh, anybody, anybody else want to comment on that? Um, I think we're pretty close to our time. We could start taking questions if that would work.
Thanks for the session. Uh, one of the topics which always comes up about underserved market is availability of credit. Uh, on the other hand, we have talked about financial literacy, financial education also. Is providing credit to underserved population which has not dealt with it properly earlier uh, prudent? Does that topic ever come up? And well, what does the industry do about it? That's a great question. Uh, just let me, uh, before um, we let Nan answer it, I, just so everybody heard it, he basically said, um, uh, is credit the right solution for um, not particularly literate um, low-income customers? Um, and uh, it, it should, are there ways to do that, to provide credit to that group that, um, that are uh, ethical and work for their advantage rather than disadvantage. Yeah, I'll say on behalf of all the fintech lending in this room and, and the, the responsible American Fintech Council, a lot of these companies were born out of the Great Recession and the Great Financial Crisis. And we all like had beaten over our heads the Elizabeth Warren messages about complexity and over complexity and alt A mortgages and no interest mortgage you know, no interest payment mortgages and and you know, minority borrowers being pushed into mortgages that were much higher rate than than the ones they actually qualified for. And so all of that needless complexity, our companies that came out of that time period that were born shortly after that time period tried to go the opposite route. And, and partially because they were all people applying online from their smartphone, simplicity is like essential to getting people through the flow. And so I would say the combination of like the ethos of the responsible sub 36% FinTech platforms and lending and now banks, coupled with the fact that the use of funds is typically refinancing out of higher cost debts, right? or avoiding in an emergency situation or for a large purchase, a higher cost debt. So if you think about, you, know, you, you talk about crypto, you know, crypto lending, you know, I think of that as there was a huge bubble, like a tulip bubble. There's a lot of really useless lending. There's no utility to it. And a lot of people got hurt, right? If you think about what all the platforms here are trying to do, we're trying to help the person avoid the rent to own store, right? Can we get somebody a 15% APR simple installment loan rather than 125% APR rent to own product or a, you know, can we avoid a 299 credit card and give them a 16% three year installment loan to pay that off and, and save them a thousand dollars of interest. So coming back to what Aaron Klein said about making it less expensive to be poor, I think at its core, simple installment loans, personal loans below 36% APR are a great way for a consumer to get their financial house in order to learn how to handle credit. And it's the same structure as a mortgage. So if you can get out of debt, and you, you, your positive rental payments are now reported finally to, to Emirate and to the, to, you know, you're getting credit for paying rent. Now all of a sudden you're on the path to being a homeowner and potentially building wealth through home ownership, which is one of the things that we all, we all want. So I absolutely believe that, that in simple form, when products are kept simple, simple installment loans especially, are a great example of a product that can be used in, in financial education. And, and so in short, I think we should kind of reject the dichotomy between literacy and access, because if, you, if that's the way it's framed, you're basically saying to the borrower, we blame you for not being literate. When the dichotomy should really be, is the product responsible versus not responsible? And so I think what Nat is saying is, if your product is responsible, then you can promote access. And we frankly seen that, and, and studies out of the Philadelphia Fed by Jalop and others have shown that FinTech lending is able to reach areas where traditional banks are not yet we do it at a cap of 36% APR in an installment product, and versus credit cards, we're able to save you hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it really is about responsibility of the companies. I would not put the responsibility on the consumers. That's a great point. There are, there are so many predatory products and companies out there, right? And let's not overlook that. And many of them fly under the FinTech banner these days. And so I think it's, you know, it's important to, you know, the industry and industry associations can help play a gatekeeping role there's also a long running debate about how to get more of this small dollar lending into the banking system where presumably regulated players will operate a little more responsibly. And it's been really hard. Um, and, you know, study, the FDIC did studies like going back 12, 13 years. It's, it's, it, it was hard to paint the picture of how that could be profitably done inside of a bank. Um, and, you know, that's an area where I would like to see a little bit more work. I don't know if the OCC's project reach will help shed some light on that question or not, but. I'd like to see a little more effort put into how do we bring that kind of lending into the banking system. 
Um, and you know, I think there's been a sort of a stigma around subprime or non-prime lending and a, a general uh, aversion to uh, too much of that being done in the banking system. So maybe that'll change. The, the reputational risk is generally viewed as high because even if it makes sense for a bank to be making a 36% or more short-term loan, um, the optics are often uh, uh, scary for those who are doing it. And even though it, that might be a highly responsible um, alternative to other types, to overdrafts or, or payday loans. Yeah, yeah, you're just, one, you're just one bad collection story away from a really nightmare well, PR situation. One other dimension I will bring here that really relates to consumer education. Um, I think we are far away from the days where you need to send a letter or apply somewhere to get an understanding of what your credit report looks like, what your credit score is. I think the dissemination of tools, availability of tools that provides that easy access to consumers to understand where they are, what's in their report, and, and, and importantly, providing them with some tools that shows them if they do these different actions, here's where they end up in terms of really budgeting, understanding the consequences of being delinquent or going over, over limit, things like that. We've seen that as consumers gain more access to those type of tools, many offered through um, multi, you know, fintech uh, companies, there has been a significant improvement in, in understanding of scores, in understanding of credit health and financial health that have ultimately um, helped the consumer. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I'm, I'm personally uh, you know, been a little sad that um, many of the personal financial management um, startups uh, in the fintech space haven't really made it independently. But I would encourage any fintech that is providing any type of credit product or investment product to take advantage of the, of the ability to aggregate financial data and provide really meaningful financial advice through personal financial management um, software applications. Uh, that, that is where you can really be pro uh, providing value. You may not, you're not going to be able to teach someone finance, but you can use software to help lead them to the right answers for them. And I think that's critical for, for any lender today. I mean, the research has shown, Director Chopra earlier this morning expressed some skepticism around financial literacy, and I think he's very justified in that approach. But, you know, I think the research has also shown that in the moment where consumers are making decisions, it can be very effective if served up in, in the right way. And I think, you know, technology can help in that regard, but it has to be simple, it has to be easy, right? I mean, you can't expect somebody to read a 20-page thing that, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I work with uh, Mocafi, um, who has some partnerships with various cities, uh, offering a target of a, like a deposit account financial services to inner city black and brown uh, people. And uh, like, I think there's a real opportunity to on the literacy side, if there's public-private partnerships on some of this stuff through through the cities, actually reaching out to people who really need it. So I, I like their model for that. Other, other, like other questions that. before we go? The agencies uh, issued this data on the use of alternative data in 2019, right. and it was very cautious. Do you think it would help uh, encourage more lenders to make alternative data loans if the agencies issued uh, a statement that provided greater clarity about what the what are acceptable practices versus where there's potential risk. I'll push that to John. Yes. Yeah. I, w I guess I would challenge that it was as negative as you, you posit because in some ways when regulators are totally silent on a topic, it can be even worse. So, so clarity that, that you can do something, but you should do it responsibly, even if it seems sort of cautionary, can help push a financial institution that has no experience with a fintech partner or an alternative data source to say, okay, I, I see that I can do this, I just need to do it the right way. So, um, but I agree with Jonah, you know, more, more support was, was always better. Yeah, but we always, I mean, we encourage our clients too to co show the regulators why they think the way they're doing it is right and to help understand where the regulators are coming from so they can have an honest discussion with themselves about are we actually achieving the objectives that we right. say we are? Okay, we've been, we've been given the hook. So uh, thank you for uh, listening, and thank you to the panel for participating, and thank you far away, Dan. <laughs>